Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you, I hope you have, you're having a fantastic conference. I wish I could be there with you. Um, yeah. So, I think I'll just start because we have a lot to talk about. So today I'm going to talk about uh, writing secure code in Python. Uh, let me start doing a quick introduction. I just uh, want to to explain. What, what is my motivation behind this talk? So I'm sure everyone who's worked with Python or even just, I don't know, messed with the, the language a bit has heard this before, that programming in Python is easy. And this is something uh, I don't disagree. Uh, I think it's one of the core strengths of the language. But I believe people sometimes um, can seem to understand that while, whoops, while it's really easy to create uh, a Python program that uh, runs, that success successfully executes. It's not always so trivial to write um, a quality code that is both Pythonic uh, and secure. So um, today, of course, I'm going to focus on the security side uh, because um, over the years working as a Python developer, I got the chance to to see uh, a few patterns with Python code that sometimes we as developers don't think too much about and may end up becoming a security risk and or a security vulnerability. So I basically made a list of things that, uh, and that is what I'm going to show you today. Some topics are a bit obvious or may seem a bit obvious to uh, those of you who are more experienced, but overall we got uh, lots of cool things to talk about today. So uh, let's start. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, the function, is about the function evo. So uh, yeah, so the topic is evo is really dangerous. So let's start. For those who aren't familiar, uh, evo, uh, which is short for evaluate, is a built-in function that evaluates a Python expression and returns its result. So I added a few examples on the side of how the function can be used. And the first two examples are uh, simple mathematical expressions. But in the third example, we can see that uh, with Evo, we have access to building functions like sum. And in the last example, we see that uh, with Evo, we can uh, even access uh, declare variables uh, outside of Evo. So uh, I declare uh, uh, the variable x, and I uh, can access this variable uh, inside of Evo. Uh, the function can receive uh, two optional parameters, uh, which are globals uh, and locals. They're basically dictionaries that uh, define what will be the global variables and the local variables available from Evo. And yeah, we're going to use this, these parameters. Uh, you'll see how. So uh, the, the danger with this function begins with, well, if a, if a user tries to to run a malicious code, a malicious expression, uh, such as uh, this simple expression to, to remove all the files from, from the computer using uh, os.system. Uh, and yeah, evol evaluates this, uh, this expression and executes this code. But uh, considering uh, we can control the global variables with the global's uh, parameter, maybe we can manage to securely run uh, this function. If we try to pass an empty dictionary as the global's argument, well, that will work. So uh, we'll, we'll get uh, a name error because OS is not defined anymore because uh, we cleared the global variables and OS was a global variable. But uh, the problem is Python uh, automatically inserts buildings when we don't, uh, when we use, a, a, even when we use an empty dictionary as the, the global's uh, argument. So yeah, we don't have access to the imported OS module, but we can import it ourselves using the Dunder import built-in function. But then again, we can control the globals, so we can specifically clean the built-ins. Uh, maybe then we can create a, a kind of secure evolve. Uh, and yeah, that again will work uh, if we, uh, instead of passing a, an empty dictionary as the global's variable, we pass a dictionary with, with uh, the, the built-in key set to an empty dictionary. 
then we, we are clearing the, the built-in variables that Python automatically inserts. And then uh, the Dunder import ma uh, function is not available anymore. Uh, but maybe we can work it out some way uh, because yeah, we can. Uh, we, we don't have uh, any built-in, and we don't have uh, uh, any global variables. But we still can create Python objects uh, using uh, the literal form. So uh, I can create, for example, uh, a tuple using uh, instantiating the class tuple. But I can create a tuple using the literal form, which is the the parentheses, opening and closing the parentheses, which creates a tuple. So, uh, okay, what if I create a tuple with the literal form and access the Dunder class attribute? Well, then I get the class tuple. And if I access the Dunder base uh, attribute, I got the object class. And we know that um, everything in Python is an object. So if we uh, call the subclasses method, the Dunder subclasses method from the, the object class, we basically get all loaded classes uh, in our program. And uh, right now we're looking for a specific class that is the built-in importer, because with this class we can uh, import whatever we want. So uh, basically what we need to do uh, is uh, iterate to, through these subclasses, not these object subclasses, look for the one that is called built-in importer and instantiate it and call the its method load map module uh, and then we can import the OS module and call the system uh, function with uh, the malicious code. Uh, but we need to do that in one line uh, because, well, we're calling in from inside the evolve function. And yeah, the conclusion is evolve is really dangerous in we can really create a secure evolve. We can uh, uh, basically do the, the payload uh, with, uh, with a least comprehension. Uh, the, this code is from netsec.expert. Uh, you can check them out later. It's a, uh, a good source. And yeah, so what are our alternatives since we can use uh, or we shouldn't use the, the evil function? Well, uh, we have the literal evil from the AST module. And with this function, we can um, basically create uh, an object, a Python object but only using its literal form. So I have these examples here. So we can create uh, 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 any kind of number. We can create uh, a tuple with different kinds of objects inside. But we can uh, really evaluate uh, an expression. For example, we can do a mathematical expression such as 1 plus 1. Uh, it, it will not run. It, it, it's going to be a, a value error. And if we need something more complex, we can try to parse the string ourselves and implement the code ourselves, which will be, of course, uh, more secure. Uh, so basically, uh, when should we use Evolve? Uh, so we have this function available as a built-in, and when should we use it? And my answer to this is we should use Evolve basically when there is no other viable way to accomplish a task. And well, when we, when we work with Python for long enough, uh, you realize that this means basically never. Uh, you should never use evil. Uh, that is no, uh, um, there is no, no, no really useful, uh, it, uh, yeah, it's not useful enough to, uh, to, to, uh, to have the security risk. Okay, so let's uh, jump into uh, topic two, which is about uh, arbitrary code execution with Pico. Uh, as I said, I, we have uh, many topics. They're quite different from each other. But um, yeah, so let's jump into it uh, to managing time. Uh, OK, so uh, about the Pico module. The Pico module uh, is a, a way in Python to store a Python object. In, we, we serialize this Python object to a sequence of bytes, and we can load this object, this, this serialized object, later if we need the, the object. So uh, we basically do that with the dump um, function. So we serialize an object with the dump function, and we load it when we need to load it 
using the load function. So uh, on the right, I have uh, an example of that. I, I serialize a set of numbers uh, and I save it to a file and then I load it uh, from this file. So the file is, is uh, a binary file. I load the, 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 these bytes and they uh, are deserialized to uh, our Python object, which is uh, the set of numbers. And uh, again, with these functions, with the dump function, we have uh, optional parameters we can use. Uh, so uh, we have this protocol argument, which is an integer denoting what protocol uh, is going to be used for the serialization. Uh, and we currently have five options to, to, uh, for protocols that goes from zero, which is the oldest one, and is basically the human readable one to five, which is the newest, uh, which is available from since Python 3.8. Uh, okay, so uh, what if we need to customize how a class is serialized? Uh, Python usually knows how to serialize all kinds of objects, but if we need to, to customize how a class instance, uh, how, how an object is going to be serialized, we can do that using this magic method then the reduce. So this method should return a string or a tuple containing a callable and its parameters. And we are going to focus on this uh, on the second option, which is a tuple containing a callable and its parameters. Uh, yeah, so, okay, so we can create here uh, a class called uh, exploit pickle, uh, which implements the, then the reduce method. Uh, and I'm returning uh, uh, the First, the callable, which is the OS uh, dot system, which I'm, I'm using as, as an example, and I'm returning the uh, what what arguments should be passed to this callable, uh, which is the the, the RMRF uh, code to delete all the files. So yeah, okay, we can serialize it uh, normally. It, it's going to be serialized uh, to bytes, but when you load it. Uh, if, if, we, if, if we call uh, pickle.loads uh, to, to load the, the bytes and deserialize it to a Python object, then this is going to run. And uh, if the interpreter has the, the right permissions, it's going to delete uh, all the files. So uh, the, this code inside reduce is going to be executed. Uh, we can uh, use pickle tools, which is another module available uh, from the, the standard library to basically read the pico and understand uh, what is doing behind the scenes. So uh, let's just uh, understand what, uh, how can we, we read uh, a pico file to maybe create a more complex one. Uh, okay, so uh, using the, the pico tools uh, dot this uh, function, we can uh, read the raw pico and I'm going to, to basically uh, go through the, the Pico code. So uh, the Pico starts with the C character. The C character uh, is used to import, basically import a function. So uh, we, use, we have the C character followed by POSIX, which is the module, a line break, and system. So uh, to import a function from a module, we have C, the name of the module, a line break, so now it's not the name, main name of the module, it's the name of the function, system. So we are uh, basically calling this, this function, we're importing this function uh, uh, to, to our code. Uh, then uh, we have this uh, open parameter. So uh, here uh, when it says uh, 14, uh, the line 14, uh, with, uh, uh, the column 14, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's uh, a mark, so it is the, uh, it, it is the, the the arguments mark. So uh, we start to provide what arguments are going to be passed to this function we just imported. So the first argument, which is the only argument, uh, is uh, an Unicode string. And to denote a uni Unicode string, we use the, uh, the uppercase V character and uh, followed by the string itself. So in this case, the string itself is the RMRF uh, code to delete all the files. We then basically co close the parameter. So uh, in column 14, we open the, the list of parameters. And in line 24, we use the T character to uh, close the parameter. So the only parameter we're passing to the function we imported is the Unicode string RMRF. Then uh, in column uh, 25, uh, we have the uppercase R 
which is the reduce itself, uh, which then uh, executes the function with the provided parameters uh, we specify. And on, my, on column 26, we have the, the dot, which is uh, signalizing that the pico ended. So that's basically uh, what this pico means. And uh, with that, we're going to try to execute arbitrary code because uh, in the example I showed before, we had uh, a simple uh, OS dot uh, system call. But what if you want to, to really run any kind of code, like a reverse shell? So we have a, a function here for a reverse shell. We have this import uh, inside the function to, uh, well, because we, are, we want all, all the code, uh, all the necessary code to be uh, inside uh, one function. So this is basically a, a reverse shell. So the attacker can uh, control the, the, the victim shell uh, from the, their computer. Uh, how can we uh, run? this arbitrary code with Pico. Uh, okay, so first we need to serialize this code. The problem is Pico can really serialize code. Uh, so we have to use Marshall, which, which, is another, uh, um, which is another module inside the Python standard library to serialize the code. And yeah, we, we have the, the dump and dumps and load and loads uh, functions uh, as we have in, in, in Pico, we have in Marshall. And we can uh, serialize the function with marshall.dumps, and we uh, will then have the, the sequence of bytes. And we uh, we can just make more readable. We can uh, encode with base64, and then we'll have a, a base64 uh, string, which is basically the code of the function. And if we need to to run the function again, uh, we then just reverse the process, we decode with base64, we load with Marshall, and then we need uh, to instantiate it with the function type uh, class to, yeah, just providing the, 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 the result of Marshall loads. And then we can call the function as if we, if we implemented the function in the code. Uh, so, okay, let's create the malicious pickle. Uh, I just explained how the pickle works, so let's go through it. We have the, the C denoting we are importing a function, so it's from model types. Uh, it's the function function type. Why we're importing the function type first? Because the function type is what calls the. Uh, is it, we want the result of the function type. We want to to run the function type result. Yeah, so uh, inside the function type, what are going to be its arguments? Uh, so here uh, we have the, the on, on the right, when we have the, the column 20, we have the mark to open the parameters. And in column 21, we have uh, uh, another import, which is the, the Marshall loads. Uh, we then have uh, on column 36, uh, another mark for parameters, but then for the, the Marshall loads function. And uh, for this parameter, we have another import, which is the uh, B64 decode from B64. And then for B64 decode, we have uh, another parameter in column 55. And uh, now we're going to not going to import anything more. We're just going to pass the, the, the value, which is an Unicode string. So in column 56, we have uh, the uppercase V denoting an Unicode string, which is our uh, B64 uh, encoded function. We then have on column 81 the T to close the arguments to B64 decode. Uh, in column 82, we have the uppercase R to execute the B64 decode. Uh, in line 83, we have the T to close the arguments for Marshall loads. And in column 84, we execute the Marshall loads. And then in column 85, oh, I'm sorry, I, <laughs> I said we didn't have any more import, but we have the building globals import because uh, as I showed in the, in the previous slide, we have to use for, in the function type, we have to pass the globals. So yeah, we use the globals to, to pass as a, the second parameter for the function type. Uh, the globals is a function, so we have to, to call the, uh, we have in column uh, 106 and 107, just uh, an empty list of uh, arguments. We then uh, use on column 108, uh, the uppercase R to call the globals. Uh, and okay, on line uh, uh, 111, we uh, close the parameters for the function type. And 
no, I'm sorry, it calls the parameter for the uh, um, for the Marshall loads. Yeah, um, I, I got lost. But uh, in the end, uh, we, in line 1105, we uh, execute the function type. And on line 116, we uh, stop uh, the code. So yeah, we have our malicious pickle. And I got uh, a, really, uh, a small demonstration to it's a, it's a GIF just to show it how it would work. On the right, we have uh, the server code executing, waiting for the connection. And in the left, we are going to open the malicious pickle. And yes, when it loads the pickle, uh, then the reverse shell is connected and uh, we can execute any command we want from the, uh, from the server. And OK, how can we prevent that? Well, we can prevent that by signing the pickle with uh, uh, cryptographically secure uh, uh, hash like HMAC. So uh, here we we are creating a, a digest uh, for the the for the pico with HMAC on the left. And uh, if we save this digest, we can uh, check when we want to load if the digest is is the same. And then if if it's it's the same, then we can trust it. We know it's secure. And we can uh, we we also have alternatives. So instead of using pico for uh, for storing uh, objects, we can maybe use a safer serialization format like JSON, which is uh, really, uh, really simple. Well, yeah, I have an example here, which is just a string. Um, yeah. OK, so let's uh, go to our uh, third topic. I'm going to try to be a little fast because uh, we have uh, still a few things to, to talk about. And, and now uh, we're going to talk about the power of the pip install command. So uh, first, we have to understand what happens when we run pip install. So uh, I basically divided into four, uh, four things that happen. Uh, it, it's more complicated than that. But basically, uh, first, we have the uh, identifications of base requirements and the given parameters. Uh, then we have the resolution of dependencies and the determination of what will be installed. And the third thing that happens is the, is the determination of the installation method. Then it, uh, after determining the, the what installation method it will use, the, the package is installed. Uh, we're focusing on the, the third thing, which is the determination of installation method. Uh, and again, uh, I, I simplified what really happens. But uh, basically, the logic is if a will is available, if we, uh, we have a will uh, in, the, in the repository to download, we'll, uh, pip will download the will and install from it. Uh, if the will is not available, it will download the package source code. And uh, if it's possible to build the will from the source code, it will build the will and install from it. If it's not possible, it will install from situp.py. Uh, and this, uh, uh, we're going to focus again if the will is not available. So if the, the person who uploaded the, the package to PyPI didn't uh, upload a, a will binary. So uh, when, when pip downloads the, the package source code and uh, try to build a wheel or tries to install from setup.py, uh, in, in both cases, it will run setup.py. Setup and the thing with setup.py is uh, we're basically having a, a, a dynamic uh, metadata. So uh, here is an example of a setup.py file, which just uh, reads the, uh, a long description from a readme file and calls the setup function. But well, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's Python code, so we can have uh, things a bit more uh, complex than that. And in the right, uh, I, I just uh, put the, the comments that would be called. So to install the package, we would have setup.py uh, install and to create the, the, the to build the wheel we have setup.py with this wheel. Uh, and yeah, so we have the setup.py to, to create dynamic metadata. And how can we execute arbitrary code in the package installation uh, is by, uh, well, just adding code to the file. It's a Python file. So we can add the code we want. So uh, I'm adding the same code of the, the reverse shell I showed before. The only difference here is instead of subprocess.run, uh, instead of this function, we're using subprocess.popen because we want to create uh, a separate process instead of using the same process so that the, the installation doesn't uh, freezes and the user 
uh, we'll know it freezes. And uh, again, I have a, a demonstration. We have the, the server on the right, and we're installing the, the, the malicious zero pi, which is something I uploaded to PyPI and, and deleted. You can't uh, install it anymore. But if you, you install it, uh, it's going to execute the setup.py because I didn't put a wheel. And yeah, uh, we're going to have the reverse shell again. And what is the real life risk of this? Because you can think um, that you're not going to install any package you, you don't know. Uh, you're just using, I don't know, uh, standard uh, packages like Django, like requests. But we have a, a, a real problem, uh, which is typo squatting. So uh, let's say uh, I'm trying to install the requests package and I mistype and type this request uh, wrong, and someone uploaded a malicious package to PyPI uh, with this uh, uh, with request uh, spelled wrong, and then the, the code would be executed uh, uh, because of that. Uh, and this is uh, a, a real problem. So uh, in 2021, uh, we had uh, almost 4,000 libraries which got uh, deleted from PyPI because of this, because uh, they were uh, they were malicious. Uh, uh, and here on the, the right uh, upside, uh, we have uh, statistics from 2017. So uh, from people trying to install uh, packages that are available from the standard libraries, such as JSON, OS, uh, SIS platform, so someone uploaded this, uh, this, this packages to the PyPI, and this can be malicious packages. So if a, a, a beginner user, I don't know, sees an example that uses JSON and thinks, oh, I need to install it, they're uh, trying to install it, but they're installing the malicious package. And, uh, well, another uh, risk is if we use the extra index URL uh, flag, because uh, with this flag, uh, we can... Um, basically uh, use another uh, repository instead of the the, the standard PyPI. And, and I had uh, an added, uh, I don't have time to go uh, deep into it, but I had a, a Medium article that basically uh, is a guy that made a lot of money by basically doing this. Uh, so, okay, how can we prevent this? We can use the uh, only binary uh, flag with pip install to only download if we have the wheel. And we can require hashes, use the require hashes uh, flag to uh, uh, verify the, the, uh, the, the hash sum to know we were downloading the, the right thing. And, uh, well, you should never download a package as sudo or as admin, because uh, if you, for some reason, install a malicious package, you will have uh, the admin permission and can really do some damage. Um, okay, so let's go to the uh, fourth topic, which is about uh, outdated dependencies. Um, okay, so basically vulnerabilities are found all the time. Uh, I have here a screenshot from the, I think it's the latest or, or no, I think right now we have the 407, but uh, on, on Django release 406, uh, we uh, uh, fixed uh, security uh, a security issue, uh, which is a potential SQL injection. And yeah, this happens all the time. Uh, everyone is always uh, finding new vulnerabilities and fixing these vulnerabilities. So um, it's important to keep up with the releases of the packages we use. And uh, it's good if we can keep up with the CVE vulnerabilities list. And uh, so we know what are the I don't know, zero day vulnerabilities found. Uh, yeah, the fifth topic I want to talk about is basically a continuation from the, the what I just talked, but uh, it is specific to Python, so outdated Python. And again, vulnerabilities are found all the time. Uh, these are, uh, uh, this is a list of some of the vulnerabilities found in, in Python and when were they disclosure. Uh, yeah, and these are currently uh, unfixed vulnerabilities, so are uh, vulnerabilities that still exist. And uh, it's important to understand the status of the, the Python versions. So um, 
so we don't end up using an unsupported Python version. So uh, we have this available in the docs. So, so we know, uh, well, when will this version of Python I'm using uh, stop being, uh, uh, stop having security updates. So right now we have uh, the, the, the from uh, 3.7 that is having security updates to 3.11, which is having uh, bug fixes. And uh, 3.6 from, uh, and, and before we, it, it, it got to the end of life. So we don't have even security updates. So if you find a, a security bug, and we'll fix it for the 3.7 uh, onward, but we won't fix for the 3.6. And well, this is going to continue. Uh, one day we won't uh, uh, update the uh, security bugs from 3.7. And yeah, that goes on. Uh, also, uh, you should be cautious with deprecated functions. So uh, if you search the docs, you find some deprecated functions. Um, I, I added an, an example in the temp file module uh, with the, the make temp function, which is obsolete. Uh, you shouldn't use it anymore because uh, it can introduce a security hole uh, because of the, the of, of a race condition that can happen. Uh, we have uh, better functions to, to, to do what the, this function used to do, uh, but the function still exists. So if, I, uh, if you call the function, it will work. So yeah, you should be cautious with functions that are deprecated. You should look into it. Uh, the, sixth, uh, the sixth topic is about pseudo, pseudo randomness. So the problem with randomness. Uh, I saw this tweet a while ago. I, uh, I'm not going to show the user. I think the, it's a deleted tweet now. But uh, it was a tweet uh, talking about uh, how to create uh, a secure password generator in four simple lines of Python code. And this is the code. So uh, it's, uh, we have a, a list of, of characters, uh, a sequence of characters uh, to, to choose. Uh, we import the, the random and the choice from random, from the random module, and we use the random choice to create the, the password. This is the code that this person presented as secure. And this is a problem because of the random module and the, the well, what I call the infamous seed. And the problem with the random module is basically almost all the functions uh, in the random module uh, use uh, a seed. So we can, uh, we can determine what the seed will be with the seed function. So in, uh, here in line four, uh, I called random uh, dot seed with the seed hero Python. And well, uh, when we, we generate the password with the same method the, the person generated, we will always end up with this result. So if you uh, get your computer right now and run this code, uh, even uh, using the random module, which should be random, uh, or you think that, that it's random, uh, it will always uh, end up with the same result because of the seed. So uh, we have uh, lots of alternatives to, to generate uh, secure passwords or uh, stuff like that. So we have uh, the proper secrets module, which is great. It's, sim it's simple to use. Uh, we have uh, the same functions that the random module has. So uh, on the right, uh, the first example I, I show is the token X, which we can create a token and uh, we determine the number of uh, bytes. Uh, we then uh, use the secrets.choice to basically do the same thing we uh, the, the person was doing, but in a secure way because we're using secrets, so it's not uh, by this uh, predefined seed. Uh, we can use the urandom uh, function from the OS module, uh, which would be a little bit uh, more complicated, but we can do that. And uh, there is uh, one class in the random module uh, that is secure, which is a system random. It, just, it, it is the only class that uh, uses a cryptographically secure uh, uh, generator, random generator, random number generator. It, it is this system random class. Uh, so the last example on the right is using the system random class to generate the password. Okay, uh, the seventh topic I wanna talk about is about uh, bomb files. Um, so yeah, watch out for bomb files. We have. Uh, um, yeah, we're running out of time with five minutes left. 
Okay, uh, I'm going to to speed up to end up in this uh, this section. So uh, we have the the billion left attack. Uh, our X, uh, XML uh, functions are vulnerable to that. Uh, we can use the diffuse XML uh, package to to uh, secure that. Uh, we have a problem also with tar bombs. If we don't expect the the tar file we are extracting, uh, we can end up uh, with this path traversal problem. We can uh, prevent this by inspecting the the files. Sorry, I'm, I'm empty speed it up. Uh, so the last thing is about uh, the assert uh, a keyword. Uh, so what is the purpose of a cert? We're using a cert now for testing with PyTest and stuff like that. But we basically check if a condition is true. And if it's not true, we have assertion error. And uh, people sometimes try to save a line with a cert. So we have these uh, uh, two codes in the, in the left. Uh, I raise the value error if the password is not what the predefined password was. And in the right, I use a cert for this. But the problem is these are not equivalent. Uh, because uh, a cert actually checks for the debug uh, constant. And this debug constant is set by the O flag. So if we pass the O flag, it's the optimized flag, uh, then the debug will be false and the assert will have uh, no effect. So we shouldn't use assert uh, in our code. I just want to talk about uh, auditing our code. So we have lots of options, lots of programs to audit our code and to check for security vulnerabilities in our code. Uh, the one I'm, I'm showing in the example is Bandit. It's really simple to use. So uh, in this example, it's showing uh, the, the code have a, a, the, the random number generator a, a problem I talked before. And yeah, that's it. Uh, so just to finish the talk, I want to, to uh, tell five key points to never forget. So if we, if you learn something from, if you want to learn something from this talk, just remember these five points. Uh, the first one is to never trust user input. Um, so basically, I, I think three topics I talk about, the EVO one, the pip install and the Pico, uh, it's basically about user input. Uh, the second point is avoid running Python code as sudo or admin, so we can uh, diminish the, the damages. Uh, keep your system up to date and your packages up to date. So uh, we have the, the uh, fixes for the security vulnerabilities that can happen. Uh, read the docs. So uh, I know the docs are not always the, the most uh, friendly way to learn something, but in the docs, we'll have the, the warnings for dangerous uh, modules. We have the warnings for deprecated functions. Uh, and this is why I think it's important to some, uh, sometimes read the docs. And uh, use uh, a static code analysis tool, such as Bandit, or you, you have uh, many options to analyze the code and search for uh, security vulnerabilities. And that's it. Uh, I think I managed to finish on time. Thank you. And this is my uh, contact information. And yeah, that's it. Thank you, guys. I think we, I think we have time for one or two questions. Is there anyone in the audience would like to ask a question? If you could use the mic, please. Uh, do we have any remote questions? No. Um, well, again, uh, thank you, Jan. Another round of applause for Jan, please.